Good morning. Oh, sorry, it's later than I thought. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, this is Southmead College. Yes, this is Southmead Art College. How can I help you? Well, I was wondering whether you, you could give me some information about your painting classes. Of course. What would you like to know? Well, do you have any classes on fiber arts? No, I'm afraid we don't. At least not at the moment. And what about art classes for children? Someone told me you did weekend courses. No, I'm sorry. We used to have weekend courses for children, but we stopped them about six months ago now. You should try Gibson School of Art. I think they do children's classes. Oh, right. Yes, I know the place. My husband did a ceramic and pottery course there a few years ago. Oh, right. Well, they do offer some classes which we don't, and vice versa. The main classes we offer are for oil painting, which is always fun, and watercolours. We also have printmaking and some jewellery design. Oh, I see. Do you have any computer-based courses? Digital art, you mean? Yes, sorry, digital art. Oh, yes, they're becoming very popular these days. And we have photography courses as well. As you can imagine, there's some overlap between those and the digital art courses. I see. And are they all the same price, the courses? And where can I find a table, a timetable for them all? Regarding the price, it depends on what enrollment plan you decide to go for. Enrollment plan? What's that exactly? It's a new scheme we started mainly to help people to take as many different courses as they like. We found that many of our students wanted to take quite a range of courses, but it was quite expensive to do so. So now we have a new scheme which allows you to do between two courses and five courses. So I could do as many as five courses? That's right, if you have the time. Okay, sounds interesting. Could you tell me a bit more about the scheme? Well, the Enrollment Plan 5 lets you join five courses. Now you can only take two of those in the evening, and the other three have to be daytime classes. And the cost for one term is $450, plus uh, $50 enrollment fee, so $500 in total. Okay, I've got that. And just for two courses? Well, actually, there is one in between, which is Enrollment Plan 3, which clearly lets you take three courses. Again, there's a limit on the number of courses you can take in the evening, which in this case is just one. And then the other two during the day? That's right. And it's very similar for the Enrollment Plan 2, one evening and one daytime course. Right. And sorry, just coming back to the Plan 3, how much is that, please? Well, there's still the $50 enrollment fee, of course, and then on top of that, it's $375 for the plan. I see. And for plan two? $245 plus the enrollment fee. Oh, $50? Yes, that's right. Now, you can see the timetable on the website. There's a link on the left-hand side of the page. Okay. Well, I'll have a look at that and think about the options. Okay. If you have any more questions, just give us a ring. Thank you. Actually, if I do want to start, when do I need to enrol by? By the 23rd of this month. But I wouldn't leave it too long if I were you. Okay. Thank you. And sorry, could I take your name, please, just in case I do need to phone back? Of course. My name is Carol Purstone. Carol, C-A-R-O-L, Purstone, P-E-A-R-S-T-O-N-E. Okay, thank you very much. You've been helpful. You're welcome. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. As I'm sure most of you know, I'm June Adams, and I'm the Human Resource Manager here at the Festival Hall. Now, something you may not know is that the demand for tickets for next week's Modern Art Exhibition has been higher than expected. Considerably higher than expected, actually. We're probably going to receive double the number of visitors than we first anticipated, hence the need for us to be extremely well organized. Most of you have not worked here before, so there are quite a few things we need to cover. Now, you should already have been allocated to a team for this event, either A, B, C, or D. So let me just go over the responsibilities of each one briefly. Firstly, those of you who will be responsible for telephone inquiries and we expect to receive a large number, you will be in Team C. 
Also on Team C will be the people who greet the visitors, give out the leaflets and issue name cards. Inside the main hall, we will have a large number of staff simply on hand to give the visitors general help, information, directions, that kind of thing. You'll be Team D. Then we have Team B. All of you involved in the catering side of the event, you'll be on this team. So this includes everyone involved in preparing the refreshments and waiting on. That just leaves Team A. We will be issuing you with a fluorescent vest, by the way, because, as you will know by now, you will be stationed outside directing the traffic and ensuring that the parking space is used effectively. That just leaves Team A. We will be issuing you with fluorescent vests, by the way, because, as you will know by now, you will be stationed outside directing the traffic and ensuring that the parking space is used effectively. You will also be directing people to the hall entrance and you may need to answer some visitor questions as well. So that's just a quick review of the main areas of responsibility. Now let's look at the schedule for the rest of the day. Okay then, let me go through the schedule for the rest of the day. In a few minutes, we'll be hearing about a topic close to everyone's heart. Pay. Jenny Brown will be talking to you about salary payments and the forms you'll need to fill in. These temporary employment forms do need to be completed and returned to Jenny before the end of the week, otherwise I'm afraid you simply won't get paid. After Jenny's talk, we'll be hearing from Roger Stone, our health and safety officer. Roger will be reminding us of the general safety issues, speaking a little about the hazards of fire and what to do in the event of one starting. He'll also be talking about what security measures we have decided to put in place. After that, you'll be pleased to hear, we will have a well-deserved coffee break. This will be held in the staff canteen and should be a good opportunity for you to see the facilities we have available there. There won't be a lot of time for you to mingle and meet each other, as we only have about 15 minutes, but there'll be a chance later in the day to do so. After coffee, we're hoping everyone will be refreshed enough to start the training program in their teams. You'll meet your team leaders and go through your main responsibilities. There'll also be some training activities. We're going to use the various spaces we have for the exhibitions to run these sessions. They're empty at the moment, so you don't need to worry about damaging any artwork. Lunch will then be a little on the late side, but it won't be rushed. You'll have a couple of hours. We've arranged a buffet-style meal in the hope that people will use the opportunity to mingle and get to know each other. I'd encourage you to introduce yourself to as many people as possible. Ladies and gentlemen, we have with us today Gordon James, the accomplished sculptor and art critic. Gordon, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me dive straight in by asking you a question which I'm sure will be of interest to everyone in the audience, many of whom are seriously considering a career in sculpture. Could you start by telling us about a typical work day in the life of a sculptor? A typical working day? Well, there's a lot more variation than you might expect. You might be sketching or developing models or working on technical issues. They often occupy a lot of your time. Or you could be working on a moulding or a casting, or you could be working on logistic issues, such as calculating or ordering supplies, or scheduling with a shipper or a foundry. Of course, none of this is work you'll be judged on. I see. And for you, what would you say is one of the most important innovations in sculpture recently? One of the most important? Well, to answer that, I couldn't talk in terms of recently, I'd have to go back quite a way, maybe to around 600 BC. I am of course referring to the contrapposto. The contrapposto, as you know, is the illusion of tension and relaxation which exist together within the body. Through that innovation we learned how the body changes when it turns and twists, or the moves, the position of the arms or legs. This innovation really affected the landscape and continues to do so even today. I see. And talking of today, what would you say are essential tools of the job these days? Well, you're basically working like a 
small-scale manufacturing plant. What you're doing is creating a physical reality from your thoughts and feelings. So the tools you need vary from a heliarch welding kit to a tiny dental brush. Any tool that you could imagine being useful for shaping stone, wood, metal or clay is going to be found in the workshop. I should also mention that, for most of us, a PC is fairly indispensable these days. Not only for modelling, but also for the admin side of things as well. Just returning to some of the questions that will be of interest to the students in the audience. Yeah, okay. How does a prospective student assess their skill and aptitude for this discipline? Undoubtedly, the most important requirement for any art student is passion and devotion. I can tell you that students have come to me with very little in the way of developed talent. But through their effort and a small amount of guidance from me, they have developed great ability. Well, I'm sure the students here will be encouraged to hear that. In terms of education, what factors should students take into account when choosing an art school? First and foremost, the reputation of the school. Secondly, you need to be sure that the curriculum supports the educational direction you want to take. I would also try very hard, if I had my time again, to check the class size. You know, one of the problems with the popular schools is that class size is very large and that makes getting personal attention more difficult. Well, that sounds like very good advice. I suppose you would say that a formal art education is well worth it. Absolutely. Even if you're a genius, the alternative is very hard. You're unlikely to get anywhere these days. And art school is so inspiring. I mean, you don't want to go into it thinking you're only doing it because it's the only way forward. It's probably the only way forward, but that's not the only reason for doing it. I learned so much simply about using the tools of the trade, if you will, and of course from the teachers. But there's also this wonderful camaraderie as well between fellow students and a healthy level of competition. And this is probably the most valuable part. You're unlikely to grow and develop as you need to without this kind of experience. Okay, and just one more question if I may. Of course. Do you have any final words of advice for prospective students? Think about it seriously, because it's a big decision to make after your career. Having decided, don't fret much about talent too much. A lot of it is about exposing yourself to new ideas, about training, and about commitment. Okay, Gordon. Thank you very much for being with us. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Technology and globalization are changing the art world. Together, technology and globalization are forcing artists, forcing curators, and forcing museum directors to rethink the entire world of art. The main impact of technology, specifically the digital world, is a blurring of the line between high art versus popular culture. The main impact of globalization seems to be that the new art collectors are emerging from different parts of the globe and are pulling the art world away from the traditional centers of gravity in Europe and the United States. It is these two shifts in the art world which I intend to explore a little this afternoon. The traditional definition of high art, which generally refers to paintings, sculpture, classical music or opera, descended from the eras of kings and aristocrats. And this traditional definition carried strong connotations of wealth and elitism. After the end of World War II, the era during which the United States came to the forefront of the world of art, this Eurocentric, elitist definition began to evolve, and it has been evolving ever since. Notably, artists like Andy Warhol and Ray Lichtenstein, who used imagery from popular cultures like Campbell's soup cans and comic book strips in their work, blurred the lines between high art and popular culture, and more recently the emergence and rise of digital culture is seemingly removing what little distinction is left. So what we are seeing now is impacting on the whole field of art and the definition of what high art is. 
Contemporary art is now becoming an anarchic mix of media, techniques and ideas, a mix which shows little or no respect for the boundaries that helped define high art previously. Along with this movement, the huge reconfiguration of the market, we are also seeing a shift not only how artists produce, but also where they produce, again as a result of technology, specifically the internet. This in turn is making it increasingly difficult to define art in terms of its country of origin. What is American or French art these days? It seems these definitions are in a state of constant flux as artists move around the world with ever greater fluidity, a fluidity which has created a complex network of communication and artistic exchange that refuses to be contained by any geographical borders. The arrival of these investors is driving dealing activity to levels not previously seen. Auction houses Christie's and Sotheby's earlier this month generated $1 billion in sales, with records being set for no fewer than 19 artists. The new investors are also doing little to dampen prices. Prices are breaking records, too, due to increased competition to own high-quality pieces. For example, a Warhol portrait of Chairman Mao was bought by a Hong Kong businessman for more than $17 million during an auction at Christie's. What does all this mean for curators and museum directors? Well, they must now try to satisfy the more fragmented and complex art audience, an audience that has a vast array of media and entertainment choices at its fingertips, and may not come from a traditional art lover's background. So, in response, museums are employing new strategies to capture more of the potential audience. They are holding special events for young patrons and establishing more ties to their communities. Some museums are expanding, adding new buildings designed by famous architects to create a buzz. A good example of this is the States of Milwaukee Art Museum. They recently added a building designed by Italian architect Santiago Calatrava, with the result that the museum is now attracting a wider audience than similar museums around the country. It is not only Milwaukee who are taking this line. Other museums across the States are asking signature architects to design and build an extension for them. Examples include mid-sized museums in cities like Denver, Colorado, and Atlanta, Georgia. Another initiative being taken by museums is to engage in more high-profile international collaboration. Again, citing the Milwaukee Museum, they recently opened an exhibition of early 19th century furniture in collaboration with the Louvre and other museums in Germany and Austria. Although there is nothing new about the idea of international collaboration, this is the first time we have seen it taking place on such a scale.